أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Now in ayah number 88, Allah gives us a contrast. So that, that's how the munafiqeen are. Now the believers, Allah gives us the examples of the believers. لكن الرسول والذين آمنوا معه جاهدوا بأموالهم وأنفسهم وأولئك لهم الخيرات وأولئك هم المفلحون. But the messenger and those who believe with him strive with their wealth and with their selves, and it is they who shall have good things. And it is they who shall prosper. It's interesting when you look at the at this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, he says, Lakinir Rasul wal Ladina Amen. Walladina Amenu Ma'ahu. You see, brothers and sisters, there are there are two two types of believers. So you have the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. We've already spoken about them. These are individuals who are not even believers. They're kuffar, pretending to be mu'mineen. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says those who believe with Him, Allah here is implicitly speaking about, He's mentioning two categories of believers. So there are some believers who have faith, but perhaps... And they were probably willing to give the Prophet money, but they didn't want to join him. You know, they were willing to sacrifice their wealth, but they didn't want to sacrifice their lives. You know, some people, they'll give money, but they don't want to put their lives in danger. You know, and, and I'm sure that the same thing will happen with the Zuhur of the 12th Imam. Some people will give, will give the Imam money, but I put, I put my life in danger. They might not do that. So there are some mu'mineen who, who, who might support the Prophet with their dua. You know, they feel bad that they're not joining. Perhaps they were too cowardly. Perhaps they, they were too, they, they thought that, you know, financial support is sufficient. Allah here says, no, the best believers are those who believe and who are with the Prophet. Wherever he goes, they are with him. They don't stay behind. They don't say that, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll give you money, but we'll stay back. There are some mu'mineen, some believers during the time of the Prophet, their jihad was only financial. They weren't willing to put their lives in danger. But here Allah says, the elite among the believers are willing to sacrifice both. And subhanAllah, these are the two most precious things to people, their money and their lives. Some, some of the believers were only willing to sacrifice one of those things, money. They'll, they'll support the Prophet financially. They'll provide him with horses, with weapons. But Allah says, no, what is required of you is to be ma'ahu, to be with the Prophet. They struggle, they strive with their wealth and their selves. So this shows you, brothers and sisters, that faith is not enough. Faith is not enough for us to achieve success because Allah says, وَأُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْخَيْرَاتُ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ If you want to be a community, that is given goodness, al-khayrat, meaning goodness in this life and the hereafter. If we want to be among the muflihun, if we want to be successful people, if we want prosperity, how is it achieved? Is it achieved only through faith? Because many people, many communities, they only have faith. There's no struggling with their wealth. There's no struggling and striving with themselves. People want to stay in their comfort zones. Faith is not enough. Faith, you need to, you have to struggle 
So you have to ask yourself, okay, I have faith. I believe in Allah. I believe in the Messenger. I believe in the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. I pray. I fast. But what have I sacrificed? What contribution have I made? What, what has been my struggle? You have to take yourself out of your comfort zone. You have to be you have to be willing to sacrifice things that are dear to you. You know, some of us, our weekends are dear to us. You know, we, we just want to relax. We just want to kick back and do nothing. Sometimes you have to sacrifice your free time for you to be to receive this khayrat, to receive goodness in this life and the hereafter. Some of us, we have to be able to sacrifice authority. There are some people, they're power hungry. Are you willing to sacrifice your position for the betterment of the community? You know, there are some people, you know, I've been to some communities. It's the same board members at the mosque for the past 20, 30 years. Maybe that's your jihad, to give up what is very dear to you for the betterment of the community. Mentor other people. For, us, for others, it might be wealth. How much have you given to promote the teachings of Islam? Have you, have you contributed to the education of Muslims? What are you doing with your money? So ask yourself, what is dear to me? And am I willing to sacrifice things that are dear to me for the sake of Islam? لكن الرسول والذين آمنوا معه جاهدوا بأموالهم وأنفسهم وأولئك لهم الخيرات. These are the people that will have goodness. They are the only people that will achieve goodness in this life and the hereafter. And الخيرات is all goodness. All goodness will be given to them. وأولئك هم المفلحون. And these are the ones who will succeed. That success only belongs to these types of people who have faith, who strive with the messenger, with their wealth and their lives. People who are altruistic, who are unselfish. They're selfless people. They believe in the greater good. They give up things that are dear to them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why are they successful? Why? Why? Are, what is this khair that they're going to receive? Why are they so successful? Allah says in ayah number eighty-nine, If you think of anyone who's successful in life, you know they have money, they have a good job, they went to an Ivy League school, they're you know they're advancing in their career they have the you know the white picket fence they have everything right is that success no because that ends when a person dies true success is what to secure your akhirah to ensure that there is bliss waiting for you on the other side allah says god has prepared for them for who those believers who are with the Prophet and they they do jihad with their wealth and their selves, for these people God has prepared, God has prepared for them gardens with rivers running below to abide eternally. That is the great triumph. Notice in this ayah, you know, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises Jannah, and then sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that he has prepared it. You know, it's interesting that, you know, when you, when you want to incentivize someone to do good, like imagine you have a, a, a kid, you know, one of your kids, and you want your kid to study for their exam, for example. They have an exam, an important exam, and you want them to study. You can tell them that if you study and you pass the exam, I promise I will buy you, you know, a video game. Or I promise I'll buy you a bicycle. I promise I'll get you those new shoes, those LeBron James. I promise I'll get you a gift. Is the gift there yet? No, I promise it. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say that I promised them 
Jannah. Allah says, I've already prepared it for them. It's there. You know, so it's, it has a very different effect on the listener. So you can tell, you know, if you go back to the example of, you know, talking to your kid, if you say to your kid that I promise that I will give you a gift if you do your homework and you study and you pass the exam. But if you say that here is the gift, I have it for you. It's right there. I've prepared it for you. Study, pass the exam, it's, and it's yours. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, that not only do I promise you the reward, but I, it's already there. It's ready for you. It's prepared for you. God has prepared it for them. You know, it's one thing to say that, oh, my angels have prepared it for you. Allah says, I have taken charge of preparing this place of bliss for you. I am the one who has prepared it for you. Gardens beneath with which rivers flow. And this is a very common way of, a common description of paradise in the Quran. And I think we've mentioned this in our previous tafsir sessions. You know, people, especially Orientalists, when they write about, you know, uh, the Quran, especially those who are critical of the Quran and, and who doubt that the Quran is the word of God, they say, yeah, you know, a paradise that contains gardens and rivers is the paradise is paradise in the mind of a desert dwelling Arab you know because these people live in the desert for them Jannah is greenery and water because what do they see in Arabia sand and no water right so to a, a, a Bedouin paradise is greenery and water but the reality is brothers and sisters that Greenery and water is something that this the attraction to gardens and rivers is something in the base nature of man. That's why almost all vacation destinations around the world, if you go online, you'll find that they're a combination of greenery and water. It's part of the fitrah of the human being to enjoy these things. And these colors actually have a very calming effect on the on the psyche of the person. You know, that's why, the, you know, the sky is blue. You know, the tree, it's, they're green. these two colors bring comfort and psychological ease to the human being. You know, that's why when, uh, you know, psychologists, researchers, they say that when you, uh, when you write notes, you know, back in the day, you know, before people had laptops, people used to actually write in notebooks. They say that if you want to choose a pen, choose a pen, a blue pen. Because the color blue is a lot easier on the eyes. So subhanAllah, paradise is, is a place of optimal comfort. It's a place that contains things that all human beings are attracted to. Khalidina fiha. The best thing about paradise is that the pleasures and the enjoyments don't end. In this life, no matter how much you enjoy, even if Allah were to give you the lifetime of Nuh, it's eventually going to end. That is the great triumph. You know, in this life, when you struggle and you gain victory, after that victory, there's probably going to be another struggle. And sometimes the victories are emphatic. Other times the victories are very limited. But in Jannah, it's victory. There's no more struggle. After that victory, that is the ultimate, the greatest triumph. Ayah number 90. And those seeking to be excused among the Bedouin came in order to be granted leave. While those who lied to God and his messenger stayed behind, a painful punishment shall befall those among them who disbelieve. When the Prophet ﷺ returned from Tabuk, he blamed, he admonished, he reprimanded those who stayed behind, those who did not join him. And you know, just like kids, you know, little kids, you know, when, 
you know, I remember when we, uh, when we were in school, you know, sometimes you see kids walking in the hallways and they're supposed to be in class. And then when a teacher tells them, how, what do you, how come you're not in class? You know, what do they, what do kids usually do? Oh, but this person is not in class. They point the finger at someone else. They try to diffuse responsibility. When they get called out, instead of taking responsibility and saying that, yes, I'm wrong, they say, oh, but this person is doing it too. And that's exactly what some of these munafiqeen did. When the Prophet said, why did you guys stay behind? You guys hadn't, why, why did you not join me? What did they say? Oh, but these Bedouin Arabs also didn't join you. Now, the Bedouin Arabs who, who asked the Prophet for, for permission to stay, they actually had a valid excuse. Now, you may tell me, why did, why did they ask the Prophet permission to stay? You know, there are some people that even when they have an excuse, they still ask for permission. You know, so for example, someone is sick. He's not able to fast, but he'll still call the sheikh and ask the sheikh, is it okay for me to break my fast? Because they're so paranoid. They want to make sure that they're not held responsible. So you have many of these Bedouin Arabs. Many of them were very simple-minded and they felt embarrassed that they couldn't join the Prophet, and they asked the Prophet permission to permission to, to stay behind. Rasulullah gave them permission. Some of them were elderly. Some of them did not have the financial means to join. They were excused. So in this ayah, Allah is giving us a comparison between those who had a valid excuse among the Bedouins and then those who lied, the kuffar, the munafiqeen who lied to the Prophet. The, so those seeking to be excused among the Bedouin came in order to be granted leave. They had a valid excuse, but they wanted they wanted to, to know for sure that they were excused. While those who lied to God. So there's a contrast in the verse. The first group, the Bedouin Arabs, were not lying. They had a valid excuse as to why they couldn't join. And they were granted permission to stay behind. While those who lied to God and his messenger. So lying to the prophet is tantamount to lying to God. Stay behind. A painful punishment shall befall those among them who disbelieved. Now, the question, the next question is who's exempt? You know, when these munafiqeen are saying, oh, but these people stayed behind. They didn't have to join you. Why are you blaming us? It's because they had a valid excuse. What are the excuses that someone can have for them to be exempt from jihad, from joining the Prophet on this military expedition? Ayah number 91, Allah says, لَيْسَ عَلَى الضُعَفَاءِ وَلَا عَلَى الْمَرْضَى وَلَا عَلَى الَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ مَا يُنْفِقُونَ حَرَجٌ إِذَا نَصَحُوا لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Ayah number 91, Allah says, No blame is upon the weak, nor upon the sick, nor those who find nothing to spend. If they are sincere towards God and His Messenger, there is no argument against the virtuous, and God is forgiving and merciful. So there are three main groups that are mentioned here who are exempt from jihad. The first is al-du'afa, the weak. This includes the elderly, women, children, those who have you know physical impairments that render them too weak to join, the sick, someone, for example, who's who's blind, some of them, some an individual who has a chronic illness that prevents them from participating in the battle. So the weak, the sick, and those who are financially unable. Now, as I mentioned in our previous sessions, joining the Prophet, joining the army of the Prophet was not like joining the U.S. Army, where they give you a sign-on bonus and they give you equipment. Those who joined the Prophet, 
not only did they have to have to risk their lives, they actually had to purchase their own, they had to have their own weapons. You had to have a horse, you had to have a shield or, you know, it was very costly. So it wasn't sufficient for someone to just be barefoot and say, okay, I want to join you, Ya Rasulullah. Where's your weapon? Where's your horse? So there are many who wanted to join, but they didn't have the financial resources to purchase weaponry and a means of transportation to join the Prophet. So these people are excused only, and it's interesting, the, the message of this verse is very interesting. There is no blame on these three groups. These people, the weak, the sick, those who are financially unable, they are only exempt if they are sincere to God and His Messenger. Meaning, if they were able to, they would have joined. So if these people were sincere, meaning that if they were able to join, they would have joined, then there's no blame on them. So for example, imagine someone is sick and they can't join Rasulullah on his expedition to Tabuk. They're not, they're not able to join. But if they never wanted to join the Prophet, they're still held accountable before God. Because they're, they're, they were not sincere. They did not have ikhlas. The ones who are exempt are only exempt under the condition that if there was no impediment, they would have joined. If their hearts are with the Prophet and there was, and there was no excuse for them, so for example, a poor person who can't join the Prophet, if they're happy that they don't have to join, they're not excused and they will be punished by God. These individuals will only be excused if they are sincere. Meaning that if the opportunity presented itself and they were able to, and they actually would go forward, that's when they are excused. Meaning they're only excused if they sincerely wanted to join the Prophet. And notice Allah still calls them muhsineen. Those who are weak, you may ask, but they're staying in Medina. They're not risking their lives. They're staying behind. These women, some of these children, the sick, the poor, Allah still calls them muhsineen. Muhsineen means what? They are good doers. You may say, but they didn't do anything good. They didn't even participate. No, but their niyyah was to participate if they could. And that's an important distinction to make. Just because you have a legal excuse does not mean that you are not blameworthy. Only the ones who had the intention of joining if they could, they are the ones who are not blamed. And this is precisely what Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari this is exactly what he echoed when he visited Imam al Hussein and his companions in Karbala. You know, brothers and sisters, Jabr ibn Abdullah al Ansari, he, he was a very elderly man during the time of Imam al Hussein, and he was blind. So he was not able to join the Imam. When he arrives in Karbala on the day of Arba'in, he recites the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein and his ashab, and he says, وَالَّذِي بَعَثَ مُحَمَّدًا بِالْحَقِّ لَقَدْ شَارَكْنَاكُمْ فِي مَا دَخَلْتُمْ فِي He says, I swear by the one who sent Muhammad with truth, I swear that we were partners with you in everything that you experience. Now, Jabir was accompanied with his servant Atiyah. Atiyah was taken aback when he heard this. Qala Atiyah, فَقُلْتُ يَا جَابِرْ Atiyah says to Jabir, How is that possible? وَكَيْفَ وَلَمْ نَهْبِطْ وَادِيًا How is it possible that we're partners with them in the reward that they will receive from God? When we did not enter into any valleys, وَلَمْ نَعْلُ جَبْلًا We didn't climb any mountains. 
and we never used our swords and our heads were not separated from our bodies how can we expect to be rewarded alongside Hussein and his companions Jabir he says Ya Atiyah Sami'tu Habibi Rasulullah Yaqul Man Ahabba Qawman Hushira Ma'ahum O Atiyah I heard the Holy Prophet say that whoever loves a people he will be resurrected with them Wa Man Ahabba Amala Qawman Ushrika Fi Amalihim and who, whoever loves the actions of a certain group of people, Allah makes them partners. So because Jabir loved Imam al Hussein, he sincerely loved Imam al Hussein and his companions, and he loved the actions of Imam al Hussein and his companions, the Prophet says they're partners in the, in the reward. Similarly, in this verse, Allah is saying that those who are not who will, who were not able to participate the the weak the sick those who did not have the financial means they are partners with rasulullah in the thawab they are muhsineen as long as what they were sincere in their love and in their desire to support and join the prophet were they if they were able to the ayah ends with Wallahu Ghafoor Rahim that God is forgiving and merciful. Now question usually a sin has to be committed for us to say that Allah is Ghafoor and He's Rahim. If these people are excused and they're not obligated to join the Prophet, why is Allah saying that and God is forgiving? And he's merciful. The word ghafur literally means, in the word ghafara, literally means to cover up, to cover up something. And the idea here is that Allah will cover you. You know, some of them felt embarrassed, they felt ashamed that they couldn't join the Prophet. Allah says, I will cover you, meaning that I will cover this sense of shame and humiliation and regret that you have with the garb of dignity because I'm giving you an official exemption that I will cover you and Allah is Rahim why is he Rahim because he's accepting the little that they're offering they're not joining the Prophet in battle but Allah accepts even their intentions the fact that they intended to be with the Prophet had it not been for these impediments, Allah says, I accept it and I will reward you handsomely for your intentions. You are among the muhsineen in my eyes. And then in ayah number 92, يُنْفِقُونَ <laughs> nor upon meaning there also there is no blame upon those who when they came to you to give them amount and you said to them i find nothing upon which to mount you turn back their eyes flowing with tears grieving that they found nothing to spend you know brothers and sisters it's very sad that many there are many Muslims that believe that the the Shias they condemn and they curse the companions of the Prophet. This is not true. Our view of the Sahaba is the Quranic view. We condemn those who did not obey the Prophet. We disassociate ourselves from those who disobeyed the Prophet. But here is an example of some of the noble companions of the Prophet. There were individuals among the Sahaba who were so eager to join the Prophet, but they were poor, they had nothing. So they come to, to the Prophet, they want to join the Prophet, they say, Ya Rasulullah, do you have a sword for us? Do you have mounts? Do you have horses or camels, a way to allow us to join you? So there were logistical limitations. 
When the Prophet told them that I have nothing to carry you, I have no horses, I have no weapons to give you, I have nothing to give you, what was their reaction? Was their reaction, oh, what a, what a relief? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, they started to cry. Can you imagine how much faith these individuals had? They're poor. They're, they are poor companions of the Prophet who are so anxious to join the Prophet that when the Prophet says, sorry, I don't have any way of bringing you with me. Now, keep in mind, this is battle. They could die in the battlefield. When the Prophet says that I, I can't take you, you, you don't have to join me. You're exempt because you don't have the financial means to participate. They weren't relieved that they were granted permission to stay behind. So you see the, the sharp contrast between the way that these noble companions are reacting to those other affluent companions. They start to cry over the fact that they missed out on an opportunity to earn the pleasure of Allah. Now, my question, my question to myself and to all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, is that do we feel remorse? Now, we should all feel remorse when we commit sin. That we, we would hope that someone would have this nafsul lawama, the self-accusing soul. But how many of us feel remorse when we miss out on a good deed that we're excused from performing, like a mustahab action? We're not, we're, we're excused from performing. We're not blamed if we miss it. How many of us cry or feel grief when we miss Salatul Layl? Or we miss an opportunity to do good? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises these people. You know, some of us, we cry if we lose $1,000. We cry, some of us will cry if we lose $50. But how many of us would cry or would weep over missing Salatul Fajr? How many of us would weep and feel regret and remorse over missing out on an opportunity to do something that's pleasing to God. It's an entirely different attitude. So feeling spiritual loss, you know, we're very, we're very good at responding to material loss. We lose money, we lose, you know, things that are valuable to us and we grieve. But how many of us grieve over lost opportunities? This is one of the reasons why the Day of Judgment is called Yawm al -hasra. The day of regret. And it's a day of regret for the believers and the disbelievers. For the disbelievers, for obvious reasons, they squandered their lives. But it's also a day of regret even for mu'mineen who enter Jannah. Because if they had seized more opportunities in this life, they would have ascended to higher levels in paradise. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahirin if there are any questions or comments so there was a question from last week I think I'll just begin by answering uh, that with your permission so the question from uh, last week uh, someone asked about one of the sons of uh, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, whose name was Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. And the question is that why was he not called Muhammad the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Why was he called Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya? Now, Muhammad, the son of al Hanafiya, he's basically called the son of his mother. Now, his mother, her name was Khawla. Al Hanafiya. She was from uh, the Hanafiya tribe, and the reason why he became popularly known as Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya to distinguish between the sons of Fatima to Zahra and the sons of other women. And 
if you if you study the the battle of Jamal or Safin, I believe maybe it was the battle of Safin, or maybe Jamal, I don't recall. But in, in that battle, Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya was there with his father, and Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein were also there. And when Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen gave the standard to Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, his son, and he told him to go penetrate enemy lines, he went and he got showered with arrows and then he ran back, you know, to regroup. And Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, he says to Amir al-Mu'mineen that I, I couldn't uh, get through because I was overwhelmed by, uh, by the arrows. Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, he says that this is from your mother, meaning that the sons of Fatima are different from other sons. So Amir al muminin he gives the standard. I think it maybe was the battle of, of Jamal. I don't recall exactly, but it was one of the battles. Imam Amir al muminin gives the standard to Imam al-Hassan, and Imam al-Hassan penetrates enemy lines, and Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya is watching, and he feels embarrassed that he wasn't able to achieve what Imam al-Hassan achieved. And Imam Amir al muminin alayhi salam notice, notices this and he says to his son that do not compare yourself to Hassan and Hussein because they are the sons of the Prophet, that they have the blood of Rasulullah, the blood of Fatima to Zahra in their veins. So Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya became known as Muhammad, the son of al Hanafiya, his mother, to kind of distinguish between the sons. Of Ali through Fatima and through uh, and through other women because the the sons of Fatima to Zahra were were unique and they were uh, in a, in, a, in a category of their own. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum uh, assalam, You just spoke about. Uh, Muhammad Hanafiya, what about uh, Abul Fadl Abbas? He was known as uh, Abbas bin Ali. Uh, so he was also from a different mother. He was also from a different mother, but Abul Fadl al Abbas, he, uh, he was unique in the sense that, you know, he, he was called the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib because he had the qualities of Ali ibn Abi Talib in him. Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. He had noble traits, but there were traits in him that were definitely not from his father. They were from his mother, and which is why I mentioned the story of you know uh, his hesitation in the battlefield. That's why Amir al muminin says, you know, that the the, uh, the the genes of your mother caught up with you. So it, it was basically Imam's way of saying that that's not that's not from me. That's from what you inherited from your mother. So, but Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was, uh, he, he was almost like the reincarnate of Ali ibn Abi Talib. In fact, some of the enemies, some of the enemies of Imam al-Hussein on the day of Ashura, when they saw Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, some of them thought that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib had risen from the dead because of how much he reminded them of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he, uh, he was an exception uh, to this rule. He, he could be called the, uh, he was called the uh, Abbas, the son, of, uh, the son of Ali. Meaning he had, he had more of the qualities of Ali ibn Abi Talib in him than his own mother. Whereas with Muhammad ibn al-Hanafi, there was more of his mother in him than his father. Especially in the battlefield. Yeah, and uh, also this is a follow-up uh, answer, uh, Shay. Um, maybe because of his uh, uh, grandfather from his uh, mom's side, Mulai Busina. He was known as Mulai Busina, the one who used to play with uh, uh, spears and arrows. And uh, the history of uh, his uh, mother's side also contributed a lot to his bravery. Absolutely. Yeah. 
absolutely. In fact, Amir al Mu'mineen, when, when he approaches Aqeel to find him a, a spouse, he, he says to her, Ya Aqeel, he says to his brother Aqeel, Ya Aqeel, Find me a woman who comes from a tribe of warriors. So the Imam alayhi salam, so Fatima bint Hizam al Kilabi, Umm al Banin, definitely. I mean, there's, uh, there, are qual there, are, there are qualities that uh, Abdul Fadl Abbas inherited from her, without a doubt. But as I said, when people used to see Abdul Fadl al Abbas, he, his his mannerism, his courage was strikingly similar to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Any other questions or comments? And um, in the next verse, in this verse uh, 88, it sounded like uh, earlier on in the year there were mainly uh, two main categories of people being mentioned, the believers and the hypocrites. But now the believers have been subdivided into two groups according to how willing they are to sacrifice to Allah. Yeah. Kind of the third category being introduced here. Yeah, and it's and I think it's it's important for us because mu'minin are not a monolithic group. You know, there are various degrees of uh, faith. And this also goes to show that you know, there are mu'minin, there are some there are people that have iman, you know, a lesser degree of iman that might have vices like Cowardice. So someone can be a mu'min and also a coward. So some of the some of the companions, perhaps, they they believed in Allah. You know, they are they believe that Rasulullah is the messenger of God, but they, they're afraid for their lives. So they were they were not willing to join the Prophet on this military expedition, but they were willing to give him money. So their their willingness to sacrifice was only to a certain limit. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that the ones who will be given goodness in this life and the hereafter, and the ones who will truly prosper, are the believers who are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, who are willing to be with the Prophet through thick and thin, who are willing to sacrifice not only their wealth, but what is most dear to them, which is their own selves. So, so this is really to draw our attention to the uh, the varying degrees of faith, and not all mu'minin are equal. You know, there are the believers, and there are those you know aladina amanu ma'ahu. In the same way, our imams have many followers, but you have you have the inner circle, and then you have you know the muhibbin, the lovers of Ahlul but the actual followers, the uh, the distinguished. Disciples of the Imams, you know, they're they're in a category of their uh, of their own. So when you look at the companions, some of them are munafiqeen, some of them were believers, but they were they were willing to make minimal sacrifices. And then you have this final category of those who believe and who are with the Prophet, and who struggle with their wealth and their uh, themselves uh, thank you and um, there's another question um, if uh, we make nazar for a specific thing like you mentioned the nazar to stop doing a specific sin but then we forget the amount of money we promised to put aside is it still wajib on us to fulfill the nazar so it, it's it's still uh, it's still wajib to fulfill uh, the nazar and in that case if you don't remember you you estimate uh, so, for example, if you can't remember if it's uh, if it's you know your nether was ten dollars or a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars, it's more ihtiyati to to give two two hundred. But since you know it's for sure one hundred, you would technically have fulfilled the nether if you paid one hundred, because you know for certain it's one hundred, and then you have doubt whether it's two hundred. So you you fulfill what you're certain about, and if you want to perform ihtiyat, you can pay. Uh, on the higher end, so you estimate uh, the difference. And uh, what was the pro uh, what was the problem with the prophet? Instead of condemning the affluent who did not strive with their lives, just took their money and used it to help people in need or employ suitable soldiers. So, 
why, why didn't he take the money from the people who could afford it but didn't want to go to battle? Because like, if you remember in in in, in the in our session last week or the week before, do you remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet to be strict with the hypocrites? And part of being strict with them is to expose them. So the Prophet could have taken their money and given it to the poor, but something even more important would have been compromised, and that is to expose the munafiqeen. So when the Prophet refuses to take their money, he's achieving what's even more important than you know helping the poor, the immediate poor. He's exposing a cancer within, within the community. So the Prophet didn't take their money because uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to be a you know you know jahid al kuffar wal munafiqin alayhim be harsh with them be strict with them and one of the ways in which the prophet used to strive against the munafiqin is that he would expose them by not ex by, not, by not accepting their financial contributions so when people would see that oh rasulullah is not accepting their money it would it would basically uh, expose these individuals as munafiqin I think this question was intended more in the sense of people who were not really monophics but didn't have the strength of will or the self-sacrifice required to actually go into battle. Well, I'll, I'll, the, the Prophet would, would, he would have accepted their, uh, their, it doesn't say that the Prophet didn't accept their, uh, their money. If there were some, so for example, if someone is sick or someone is blind, but they, have, they happen to be wealthy. In fact, we we in our I think in our previous sessions we mentioned that some of the mu'minin who were wealthy and could participate they would sponsor others, and some who maybe had a physical impediment they were wealthy they they were making financial contributions to the prophet. So, if the person was mu'min and they were sincere, the prophet would uh, make use of their financial contributions. It's only the munafiqin that he wouldn't take their money to expose them. So even if a person was a moment, but he was just scared to go to the battlefield. Because but, if the person is scared to go to the battlefield, then uh, then no, the, the prophet. Uh, from from what I understand, the prophet would not uh, would not uh, accept that because that's uh, you know he, because by not accepting their money, the, the prophet would be essentially you know uh, putting them to shame. And if they're put to shame, that perhaps they'd be more motivated to participate. So, because the Rasulullah doesn't want people to think that oh, this is uh, this is in exchange that this is money that I'm paying in exchange for my participation when when I'm able to. So, if the pro if a person could join but they weren't joining for whatever reason, Rasulullah would uh, would reproach them. He would only accept financial support from believers who are who are participating or who, who had a valid excuse for not participating. All right, thank you for the clarifications. I sent some. Yeah, I have one. Go, go. Uh, Sheikh. Uh, Sheikh, uh, uh, one of uh, the ayats, I don't remember the number, uh, it said, Wallahu ghafuru rahim. Uh, please give a brief explanation on ghafir, ghaffar, and ghafur. So the the word ghafir, ghafur, and ghafar, they all contain the same root letters, ghafara. And it means to forgive, but it also, as I said, the literal meaning is to cover up. Ghafir is ism fa'il. It's, it's, it's the name of the one who's doing the action, the one who's forgiving, ghafir. Ghaffar is the one who forgives repeatedly. Ghaffar. So Allah would be Ghafir if he forgave once. Technically, he would be Ghafir. But Ghaffar is highlighting the act, the, the divine attribute of Allah forgives again and again. So if a person sins, Allah will forgive them. And if they sin again and they sincerely repent, Allah will forgive them. So there is no limit to how many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. Ghaffar. So he's, he's always forgiving. 
and Rafur is also Sigha Mubalagh. It it carries a very similar meaning to the uh, to the word uh Rafa, Rafur. He's he's often uh forgiving.